Welcome to the Herschel Smith Building for Brain and Mind Sciences, home to the Cambridge Centre for Frontotemporal Dementia and Related Disorders. Here we provide an integrated service for healthcare and research for patients and families affected by frontotemporal dementia, progressive supranuclear palsy and the corticobasal syndrome. We think the case is overwhelming that these disorders are best understood as a spectrum, drawing on their overlap and similarities. We're not pretending they're the same, we recognise that there are key clinical features that differ between patients, but there are important commonalities that we need to recognise uh, to take forward into more effective treatments. Within this spectrum, apathy and impulsivity are extremely common. They're distressing, they're risky, they come with a poor prognosis. So here at the centre we bring together regional NHS clinics for the east of England helping patients and families and we combine that with a very active research programme into their causes, the problems and biological basis of changes in behaviour and language. The study we're going to talk about today, published in this issue of Brain, is the PIPIN study, the PICS disease and progressive supranuclear palsy prevalence and incidence study. This is a large-scale epidemiological study in the east of England, recruiting all patients with these disorders. In this study we were interested in the problematic behavioural changes that we see in frontotemporal lobar degeneration syndromes, which cause substantial carer distress and patient morbidity, but remain poorly treated. Importantly, apathy and impulsivity are observed across the spectrum of FTLD disorders, despite being diagnostic criteria for behavioural variant frontotemporal dementia alone. So to move towards a better understanding of, these, of impulsivity and apathy, we need to understand the biology, the neural basis. To do that in the Pippin study, we draw on functional and structural magnetic resonance imaging of the brain, MRI, to look at the changes in the structure of the brain. So if I use this model head as an example, this you can probably see is, is an image of my brain. In patients, for example, with a semantic variant of frontotemporal dementia, the changes, the atrophy or shrinkage, is most evident in the temporal lobe causing the language changes that are characteristic early in the illness. But over time, the disease spreads and affects the frontal lobes here, leading to impulsivity and apathy. Patients were either assessed here in the clinic, or we also made home visits to patients that would otherwise be unable to participate in this kind of a study. We gathered insights from both the carer and the patient perspectives, using widely validated questionnaires measuring aspects of apathy, impulsivity and motivation. We also measured related behavioural changes, including things like depression and anhedonia, which are often observed to overlap with apathy. This is an example of one of our behavioural tasks, the stop signal reaction time task. The stop signal task is a widely used measure of response inhibition. Patients are asked to respond to arrows signalling left or right as fast as they can by pressing the corresponding right or left button. When they hear an auditory tone, they're instructed to inhibit their response and stop themselves from pressing the button. We then took these objective behavioural tasks and questionnaires and distilled them down into their major components using a principal component analysis. So having used this principal components analysis to really distill out the essence of a small number of ways in which people can be apathetic, impulsive or both, we can then look at how those modes or components of impulsivity map onto brain structure and function. Apathy, as measured by the carer, was abnormal across the spectrum, not only in behavioural variant frontotemporal dementia, for which apathy and impulsivity are diagnostic criteria. The data also confirmed that apathy and impulsivity are positively correlated. This can be seen here in this graph showing a correlation between the apathy evaluation scale and the Barrett impulsivity scale. Here, each dot represents a patient's performance on the apathy evaluation scale and the Barrett impulsivity scale. Apathy and impulsivity as measured by the patient, carer or objective measures did not correlate. They also reflected distinct underlying neural changes. Carer ratings correlated strongly with frontotemporal, frontostriatal and brainstem systems, which have previously been implicated in arousal, motivation and goal-directed behaviour. In contrast, patient ratings reflected changes in the corticospinal tracts, which we suggest reflects retained insight into their motor impairments or functional decline, while their insights into their behavioural and cognitive changes remain limited. Objective measures reflected localised changes in previously identified task-specific brain regions. For example, shown here, the stop signal reaction time task correlated strongly with the right inferior frontal gyrus, which has been consistently implicated in performance on this task. Therefore, although patient, carer and objective measures are valid, 
They clearly reflect distinct aspects of apathy and impulsivity and also correlate with different neural systems. The results of the study really provide um, proof of the value of moving beyond a diagnostic bounded view of these illnesses into an integrated spectrum. The success of this study depends not just on myself or Claire, but in fact the very large team. The members of the Cambridge Centre for Frontotemporal Dementia and Related Disorders uh, who are all, I think, excited and engaged with the prospect for improving quality of life and outcome for patients and families alike.